everybody would have heard the lovely Zoom lady saying recording is pro in progress. So we're all good to go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Barbara. And it's great to be with you here today to, to uh, discuss the IP in your business. Um, in fact, today is about IP for business. Today is the last day of the financial year. And as we all take stock, um, it's important for us all to sail a steady ship into the next financial year. And we've got some, uh, a bit of an, a presentation and, and discussion around intellectual property for business. So I might just uh, start with that first slide there um, as we move beyond our welcomes. The first thing that I'd like to say is that we as business owners uh, and you yourself are the captain of your own ship. Intellectual property uh, is uh, a, a little understood area. And, and the reason that Barbara suggested this session here uh, for us to share today is that, that you, uh, we, we want to take you underneath the hull of your own ship. At the end of the day, um, you're only confined by your ability to steer your own ship. And it's just my hope that it, by the end of the session that you may gain a few more insights in how you as the captain of your ship can actually steer yourself towards further success by harnessing and leveraging the power of your business ideas. Just the next slide, please. So and that becomes, uh, begins with a, a thorough understanding of intellectual property. Just for uh, those on the call, perhaps um, some people could pop into the chat, chat box what they understand intellectual property to be. Um, just because today is an interactive session, we'd love to hear from you as to what your understanding uh, of intellectual property is. Have you got any uh, answers there yet, Barb's? No, they're typing away, I assume. Some okay, of the... great. <laughs> so a couple of, I'll throw out a few terms as we go. I mean, your logo, your brand, um, depending on what business is, I know we've got a lot of coaches on the call, um, could be educational materials that you've developed. Barbara, you've developed a bit of copyright in your time. Uh, what are your most valuable pieces of intellectual property? My most valuable ones would be uh, probably my professional development training. So actually custom writing that training, delivering it, which can then be converted into online courses. And then there's the workbooks that go with that. So that's probably the strongest IP I've got. Um, we've got some answers here now for you as well, Gareth. Um, and I'm admitting people that are coming in. Yes. So what no, have we got? Right. Unique buying solutions, immersive that uh, yeah. UBS with logo, comp, copy, written tune. And uh, we've got um, Gavin said intellectual property represents the property of your mind or intellect. In business yes, terms, this means your proprietary knowledge. Yes. Uh, Luke has said, Luke, I know is in the tourism industry. And um, so that's uh, specialised itineraries and products. And Murray has said, things I create or put together regarding programs, retreats that are mine and not to be reused by others, question mark. Um, smell is also IPMO said. Hotel Group Holiday Inn has a scent that is their own. Oh, that's lovely. I went into the casino here and they had a beautiful um, a smell in the reception area. And I said, oh, what is that? That's awesome. So that I could purchase it. And it was from a particular, an Australian company. But that makes total sense to have your own blend. That's a cool one. I didn't know you could IP a blend and a, a scent. That's that's amazing. So there we go. There's all the responses, Gareth. You're on. You're popped yourself on mute, mute, Gareth. That's really great. Thank you so much for sharing. I mean, it's wonderful to hear that everyone's understanding, and um, it, it really is a very strong one. Um, you know, we had a, a lot of good examples there, and actually, was it Stefan who said, yeah, intellectual property is an expression of the mind or intellect. This is absolutely correct. In fact, all answers are correct. At the end of the day, intellectual property is a product of your ideas. And the legal definition, if I could ask for the next slide, please, is actually um, from IP Australia and, uh, is, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. It's an area of law which enables people to earn recognition or financial benefit from what they invent or create. 
So which is pr pretty much the same definition which we just heard online now. It is a product of the mind or intellect. Now, everyone on this call has valuable ideas within the business. And we're going to take you now through the five core components of intellectual property. So you're uh, by the end of this session today, you've got a better indication of where the IP in your business lies. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned at the start of this call, and you being the captain of the ship, it's really today about understanding where on your ship the copyright lies. Many people uh, will have vari variable and valuable uh, intellectual property on their ship. This could be patents, it could be copyright, it could be designs. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that the flag that you hoist high, your trademark, everyone on this call has a business name or a logo that is capable of registration as a trademark. All of these elements combined as an expression of intellectual property. Next slide, please. Really today is with the two pager that was delivered at the beginning of this session is about finding therefore a map towards developing an IP strategy. Once you know what's on your ship, you're more able to actually chart a course, a new trade route to success. For many people, that is about um, amplifying their intellectual property. You wouldn't be in business and you're probably not on this call if you haven't been running uh, some sort of business. Really today, is about how you can amplify those ideas and develop an IP strategy to create new trade routes and sail towards further success. Next slide, please. That begins with an understanding of copyright. So a couple of notes in the chat box. We love having interaction here in the call. Copyright, um, what is it in your business? Who can name a couple of things in their business that may be uh, Copyright. Barbara, you, we discussed this about a week ago in the terms of your business. Perhaps you'd like to like to share a few examples. Yeah, so some people have already, I can share some as, as well. Um, Murray said that she has copyright on her logo and her slogan. Murray, have you have you got that trade? I'm going to ask that question. Is that trademarked or copyrighted? That's because I know different. you're going to talk about that, aren't you, Gareth? Um, yeah. Divya said artwork. Um, the copyright Correct. that I have is, for me, is with, as I mentioned before, the whenever I'm producing yeah. printed material, I definitely put copyright down the bottom and use the C circle so to protect myself. And I know you're going to talk about that, Gareth. Um, anything that I'm that I'm any printed stuff, I'm definitely wanting to copyright. But um, I was curious to talk to you too about social media posts and what kind of protection yeah. you have for that intellect that you share, especially on LinkedIn, where you're putting a lot of detail into things. Great question. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. The answer is absolutely that any of your digital media is are actually copyright assets. So whether it's your Facebook posts or whether it's your LinkedIn posts, blogs that you are writing, all of this is valuable copyright. And now that we live in a digital world and, and sailing along these new frontiers, all of this is worthy of your protection and can be protected. So let's begin with a definition of what copyright is, um, which is the next slide, please. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. Thank you. Basically, copyright is identity. It's everything that you express in your business, whether it's digital, online, or it's traditional media. It could be your business plans. It can be your stationery. It can be your business cards in a traditional sense. But nowadays, it's a blueprint. It is, uh, Amir just mentioned, um, this is actually copyright, uh, a blueprint, business plans, marketing strategies. All of this is considered more traditional copyright. And absolutely, you can protect it in certain ways that Barbara has already mentioned um, in order to protect your business. It now exists in the digital domain as well. So your identity is very much online. And then, therefore, you can protect your posts, you can protect your blogs, and you can protect also this information. This is all covered still under the Copyright Act 1968, which is the next slide, please. The Copyright Act 1968 basically expresses copyright as a bundle of economic rights, which gives the owner the exclusive right to own the intellectual property it creates. 
it's automatic, different to any other right that we're going to talk about on this call, in that as soon as you create uh, a post, as soon as you create uh, that blueprint, as soon as you create that website, it actually comes in under copyright protection under the Copyright Act 1968. And so that's a really important distinction to make. And one handy tip that I can give you, and Mara has already mentioned it, is that on anything that you create, you should absolutely use the power of the copyright symbol. How have you used the, the symbol in your um, uh, consultancy business, Barbara? So as I mentioned before, I've definitely used it on printed material. And as somebody um, commented before in terms of copyright, it was Paul. Paul mentioned print and video. And I've just realised there's a lot of videos that I've created where I probably should put something on there to say that this video content is copyrighted. I know, Gareth, you'll probably say that any photos we use in our business, particularly if we share them on social media or videos, they are protected by copyright. But I've seen a few people, particularly with product and on Instagram, where their pictures um, have been taken by another brand and used in their marketing. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, at the moment, I'm mainly using it on print, but I wonder if I should be doing it on video or photos or other things as well. Well, listen, it's a great question because, you know, I'm, a, I'm an outside the law. I'm not just a lawyer. I'm a passionate content creator and I, I used to work for SBS television. And when we work, with film we would always ensure that we had was chain of title so if you're producing a video you actually have to engage with a number of different copyright um, owners in order to make that project so the answer to that question is basically that you, you can be using it but you need to make sure you get all the releases to ensure that you have chain of title and the copyright over that video project for example once you've done that you can absolutely say um, on your YouTube feed or even at the end of the film that it is copyright, the Time Tamer or the Hindwood Institute, for example. And it actually is, it can actually play into this next form of uh, copyright protection known as trademarks. So now that we've sort of got a, a small understanding of what copyright is, moving on to trademarks, we're actually going to talk about the first registrable right um, now, has anyone gone through the process of trademarking on the call? Could we have the next slide, please? Yeah, Mari just put her hand up. Oh, yeah, Mari. And Amir has as well, yep. Yeah. Sorry, and maybe Marie, not Marie. Marie, sorry, sorry, Marie. And we've spoken so many times, but I keep, sorry, sorry, Marie. Marie, what's the name of your business? Loving Life After Loss. Oh, okay. Interesting. Great. Maybe for everyone on the call, you tell, are you a coach consultant or? I'm a coach. Yeah. I've been uh, in mindset coaching for business owners for quite a few years. And when my husband passed, I pretty much took everything I have learned from my previous business and my personal experience through working through grief and loss and uh, created that movement to allow everybody to be happy and joyful in life again after losing someone. So yeah, Wonderful. that's basically, I just knew I had something very, very special and I wanted to trademark that because it took off quite quickly. Excellent. Have you, and have you gone down that process of, of registering a trademark? Yeah, 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 it's all done and dusted. Yeah, it's registered and, and what, trademarked. What that trademark? Pardon me? What is the name of the, the trademark? So I trademark Loving Love After Loss. That Excellent. Whole, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the name of the trainer. Thank in, you. In various in various um, areas that are important to me for retreats, for um, for groups, yeah. for like everything that it really like because there's so many categories you can choose and you pay for every extra. And I chose the most like five, four or five most important ones for my business. Yeah. Um, really good. Be, and it's really wonderful to hear about your experience with trademarks for yeah. everyone. Paul, I'm going to it's take actually not as expensive as people would think. That's, that's the thing. And it's yeah. quite important oh, actually to do that. Yeah. It's a reasonable cost and it's one of the most visible, uh, visible aspects of your intellectual property. So, Barbara, if I could just ask you to move to this section on trademarks, which is the next slide, please. Then basically, it, what is a trademark? This is a really good place to start. We've just heard from Marie that she's actually, uh, you know, trademarked uh, the name of her business, which could also be considered a tagline. However, 
an understanding of trademarks is to really understand what can you trademark. We have already heard on the call that not only we have heard from a business name, we've also heard uh, from Barbara who said the time tamer um, and she's trademarked this, which is uh, one part of her business, but also it's sense. So it's, it can be a combination of elements used to as a name or designation uh, to identify a brand, a product or a service. That is essentially what a trademark is. Now, there's one gentleman that has for over 50 years leveraged the power of his business brand through the power of trademarks. And I'm going to ask you all who this gentleman is in one moment. Could we have the next slide, please? Anyone uh, and everyone probably knows this famous face. Um, anyone uh, first, uh, first, uh, first or cab off the rank in the chat box for who this is? Basically. Branson, thank you very much, sir. Um, Richard Branson, uh, uh, a well-known entrepreneur, has used the power of trademarks um, since, uh, since the very beginning of his business, uh, which began in 1968 uh, when he was living on a houseboat and in a basement started a small magazine called Virgin, uh, Virgin Music. This turned into his first business uh, and now, 50 years later, he has registered this in a number of different categories, which we heard from Marie on the call. In fact, there's 45 different categories. And if you did a trademark search in Australia, you would find that Richard Branson owns a trademark in almost every category um, as he's now leveraged his business, music business, into such things as cola and airlines and even now shooting for the stars with Virgin Galactic. So what does this mean? It means it, uh, it's a lesson for us all about the power of trademarks. Now, if you are uh, sailing your ship towards success, this is the first step for you actually in achieving a registrable right that actually can serve to protect your name, your domain name, um, and also your business and company name, all through the power of trademarks. As Marie said, it's not that expensive to do. Um, and it does take about seven and a half months to complete but once you have completed that process, you will then have registration of your valuable brand for the next 10 years. Okay, so this is just one of the powers of, of registering some of your intellectual property to safely store it in the hold and ensure that you can sail towards success. Now, Barbara, you've been down this journey. Maybe you could describe how you went through this process and in which business. Well, with my time tamer of business, um, what I recognised going through, I did have some someone helping me, fortunately. I know that some people can do it and it's easy to navigate on your own, but I did find having someone to assist me made it easier and just asking me some of the questions about what I intended to do with my business. Because um, as you go through looking at the different classes, then it, it kind of it, it verifies where you are protected. And what I recognised recognized also is that if my logo incorporated my name then my name was well protected uh, because the name of my business was incorporated in the logo I guess like Virgin obviously as we're looking at it the name is actually in the brand rather than just a visual image um, but I've recognized that you know I've only got one class and um, I probably need to expand into other areas like books and you know things like that so yeah, it was a really interesting experience. And it also wasn't as quick as I thought, like the actual application was quick, but then there's, I think, a six month wait, so that people could can allow time for people to contest, uh, I believe. Mm. Yeah, so um, that was an interesting uh, experience as well. But otherwise, it was yeah. a simple one. And it's great that you've been on this, that experience, Barbara, because you're a, a, a great uh, example of, of someone that's been, you know, working for many years in your own business. However, you, you have begun that journey and it often begins with protecting your brand. Um, and it, it, is a, it is a very vital step in the growth of your business. So this is all really great news. Um, maybe could we have the next slide, please? So it's protected on the Trademarks Act, as we heard on the call. Who is the, the person that mentioned a cent is, um, uh, because a cent is uh, capable of, of registration as a trademark, not only perfumes, but if you've been to Melbourne, the Sofitel has a, has a beautiful aroma there too. They have trademarked their scent as well. 
Um, and it's not just scents, it's also colours. There's a famous case involves Cadbury where they actually have protected the version of purple uh, that has, um, uh, is used on Cadbury packaging. And even Prince Estate uh, has actually registered um, a Pantone colour of purple as well, interestingly. So it's not just your name, your logo, your brand. It can extend to other things such as scents. Um, and at the end of the day, it makes sense uh, to protect your most visible asset, the flagship on your ship, your brand. Apple is a huge example of, of a lot of different intellectual property and uh, absolutely a very powerful brand. In fact, if you look back on the last 20 years of businesses and the biggest brands in the world, who can guess um, what the greater proportion is uh, today? Um, in fact, the answer was just there. It's technology companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, all of these are the top 20 big, biggest brands in the world. And if we were having the same conversation 20 years ago, the conversation would be slightly different. The biggest brands in the world would be motor car companies and fast food franchises. So this it, it demonstrates you the incredible growth of intellectual property. Many of the world's biggest brands didn't exist 20 to 25 years ago. And this is how quickly your intellectual property can grow. Next slide, please. Okay, we won't cover this today, but uh, I do recommend doing a trademark search to do the uh, first step of, of actually looking to see if you can protect your brand. But I'm actually going to offer some time at the end of this call and spend uh, some time with people. And if they'd like uh, to do that, we can do some searches for trademarks then. Next slide, please. Just want to make sure that we cover the all the rights of intellectual property before we discuss that in terms of Barbara's business. Next slide, please. Okay, has anyone on the call got designs? Does anyone creating products? Maybe just pop in the chat back box if you are creating products of any kind, because design rights are designed to actually protect the look, shape, ornamentation, and feel. Here on the slide here, you can see a couple of objects and uh, which are, are products. Um, some have become less, uh, uh, less uh, uh, more redundant than others. Uh, the mobile phone has overtaken the, the camera, for example. However, um, you can bet your bottom dollar that Canon still registered any of their very valuable um, SLR designs and still do. Uh, but iPhones are protected. Um, whether it's glassware, I've got a real interest in augmented reality and watch out for um, eyewear in, in terms of wearable technology and uh, where e augmented reality is going to be the new smartphone. Um, all of these things are capable of registration as a design. Because there's no one on the call that really has many designs, we'll probably move to the next section, which is the world of patents. So if we could move to the patent slide, please. Patents are basically inventions. They protect the new inventive step. A new inventive step is how you actually protect an invention. Gareth, sorry, slide, sorry to interrupt you. I wasn't sure. There we go. That's the one. There you go. So thank you very much. Yeah, so patents can protect everything from caps. Um, they can protect uh, shoes. They protect software. Um, some of the biggest products in the world were protected in uh, patents. In fact, Thomas Edison was one of the most prolific uh, patents. He had over, his estate owned over a thousand patents and not just the, uh, the most famous ones, including the light bulb, but also the kinetoscope, you know, which was uh, an animation device in the early days of film. Uh, he was a prolific patent and he built a worldwide empire out of the value of his patents. In fact, General Electric is still, was up until recently, still one of the 20, biggest brands in the world. So the value of uh, your intellectual property is not just your registered trademark, your visible flag, but it's also your patent. And patents still have a power, even in this digital age. In fact, Melanie Perkins, can anyone tell me who Melanie Perkins is? Famous Australian. She is actually the third richest Australian in the world. At Gavin's the age putting of... his hand up. Yes, please. Gavin, do you want to open your mic and tell us? Oh, swimwear. He just put it in the chat. Uh, Melanie Perkins is actually the owner of Canva. She oh, is. Oh, whoa. 30, yeah, 30, that's right. She is too. 33 years old. She is the third richest person in Australia. 
And she built a business in less than 10 years about, built on the power of her intellectual property. She's an outstanding human being, an incredible emerging leader for a new entrepreneur, uh, uh, entrepreneurial um, uh, age group. Uh, and it, it really, she has demonstrated the power of intellectual property through Canva. She owns 97 uh, patents uh, over the Canva fun functionality, 60 trademarks worldwide, and she's worth $2.9 billion. How did she do it? Well, it wasn't just intellectual property. It was through strategy. And as in Melanie Perkins' words, she said, all you need to be successful is to find out the reason for the problem and find out what to do next. So I hope that is all encouraging and inspiring for us all on this call, that no matter what your age or who you are, you can always leverage the power of intellectual property for great success, a great inspiration and a great strength. Next, uh, but patents is one of the ways she got there and patents don't just uh, cover technology, they could uh, cover more traditional areas as well. Next slide, please. There's three kinds of patents that you can actually achieve. Is anyone on the call making an invention, creating an invention? You don't have to share what it is, just so I can see if this section is relevant. Not so much. So look, I'll just cover this really quickly because I would love to speak about Barbara's business. Basically, provisional patents um, can cover you when you're just going out into the blue ocean of your idea. That's where you're exploring the friendly shores of where you can actually take this idea further. And you, you can actually get a provisional patent for just 12 months. Um, and that's actually less costly and expensive than the next patent, actually the third patent on this list, which is a standard patent. This is when you've got a tried and true invention. It might be the Hill's Hoist, it might be the Lick Victor Lawnmower. And basically, that's when you know that you've got um, beyond prototype stage and you've really got something that is worthy of worldwide exploitation. A standard patient will actually cover you for 25 years. A lesser known patent area is actually the innovation patent. This one I quite like, especially in areas of technology. It can actually protect your business idea for eight years and you can change it as time changes. And that's really good when you're actually coming up with new ideas. An innovation patent I highly recommend protects you for eight years. Look, I'm not going to cover this in further detail because we've got, we know we've got a lot of coaches, consultants and tourist operators on the call. And it really feels to me, I'm getting a sense already of the intellectual property in your business is largely around copyright in trademarks. And there's some retreats there. So yeah, okay, so tourism. Uh, so it's really around copyright and trademarks. So I'm just going to finish this section. I'm actually moving now on to Barbara's business. Her, she has a remarkable business in coaching consultant, consultancy, and she's going on that pathway of growth. And I would love to describe that and talk about that with her. So let's let, move into a case study now where we actually explore Barbara's business. Next slide, please. Keep moving. Next one. Up, yeah. Fill the slide with your business on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This one. Oh yeah. So yeah, what we're going to do online. Thank you so much, and thank you for all your support with this event, Barbara. I really appreciate it. Basically, we're going to do now an exploration of um, IP uh, of the IP within Barbara's business. Maybe you can tell everyone on the call a little bit more about it and um, what you are doing and where you're going. Yeah. So I've been a sole trader um, with my brand, The Time Tamer, which you obviously can see and that you've been mentioning, but I've gone into a company relationship and uh, we, so now there's a lot more IP involved. And what we want to do is leverage on the knowledge. So creating a unique uh, process that we have in terms of delivering our knowledge and selling a license for others to deliver that knowledge as well. So this is where the IP becomes really important. And I guess down the track, we will also, I know Marie's doing retreats and there's other people that are doing retreats. That's going to be modeling that method of delivery. So it can be done around the world will be something that we're interested in as well. Excellent. Yeah, no, this is a really great example of a business that, as you've said on a, a, you know, a, a recent video, you just started a, trading your time for money as a coach and consultant. Now you've seen the real value of developing your IP. And I think this is a beautiful place to actually discuss uh, the growth of intellectual property and the growth of the individual behind it. Because at the end of the day, human beings drive ideas. 
So we did a bit of an IP assessment, didn't we? And we had a, a, bit, a chat about the different IP in your business. I've just got a, uh, one or two slides to actually show on your business because I, I dug deep um, beyond our IP assessment to see what Barbara had in the public domain um, relating to her business and how that relates to intellectual property. The next slide, please. So yeah, so look, looking online, you know, Barbara's got a website, she's got uh, blogs, uh, she's got Instagram channels, and you of course went on the journey of registering your intellectual property, uh, which was kind of already uh, in terms of a trademark, which we've already touched on. So I might go further down that track now. However, all of these elements that you see on the screen and many more are all part of Barbara's business. Now you've no doubt already had, you've developed marketing plans, business plans, things that are not on the screen, Barbara? Yes, and so, and again, in talking to you, Gareth, I realized also that um, I've created those online training programs. And so I've recognized that there's more, the, the, the stuff that I have in terms of my privacy policy and terms of use doesn't cut it anymore. It's very generic. And because I've expanded and have a unique IP, I've recognised how important that stuff is. So developing online programs or challenges that people might do, there's a lot of system and process that I've refined to my own methodology that I recognise is an asset that I hadn't considered as an asset before. Yeah, beautiful, Barbara. No, that's that's awesome that you've recognised that because it's true. I mean, privacy is such a great uh, an emerging area for all of us. Anyone that's got an online presence, anyone that is taking bookings online, privacy is the next human right, and it actually is a copyright. Copyright includes all the data and information that you have in your business, and in this digital world and this digital frontier then actually every business owner on this call should recognise, like Barbara has, that they need, by law, a privacy policy under the Privacy Act 1988. In fact, has anyone on the call got um, clients in Europe, for example? Um, if you're in the tourism, no doubt you're taking bookings from overseas or, you know, perhaps they were more last year or the year before last, before COVID. But I'm assuming that many on the call would also have clients um, from overseas. And one of the important things to recognise in more recent years in 2018, that now that any business that has a customer overseas in Europe has to comply with their laws with respect to privacy and the threshold around privacy protection, protecting your customer's information um, has become even greater. A lot of this has come to, with the advent of digital channels and social media giants taking data and then not using it for the intended purpose. Um, and it's really important that every business on this call recognises that they also need a privacy policy and a GDPR statement. However, let's get back onto the good ship intellectual property. Um, so we did an IP assessment. Everyone on the call should have received that two pager. And actually in just filling this out and talk, speaking about it with Barbara as we did last Monday, next slide please, what we're going to actually understand now in the context of what you have in front of you is where the intellectual property lies in Barbara's business. Now, what we discussed was you've got a number of education materials in copy, sorry, a number of materials in copyright. You have course materials, education materials, um, and they are more traditional uh, copyright. But you also have a number of digital assets there too, Barbara. Website, cop, web copy, images, social media pages, and as we just mentioned, data. You've got databases, social media followers. You've got um, information from social media. Barbara kindly um, you know, helps promote this event. And, and she's got additional information that she's acquired from you know, over 30 attendees who registered, but also through her own Facebook pages. The, the, the point is, is that all of that is copyright and it has a value to your business. If Barbara ever since sells the business, the timetable, she is going to sell it possibly with this intellectual property but you don't know what you, you if you don't know what you have you can't sell it so the whole idea in this is that you have um, an idea of what's in the hold of your ship and look that not only goes to copyright as we've explored already on the call this also goes to do with the trademarks not only the tame time tamer which is a registered trademark but i understand that 
under that under the Hindwood Institute, as is stated there on the IP assessment, that you have intentions to register this valuable asset. Maybe you could speak a little bit about that, Barb's. Yeah, so um, the Hinwood Institute is the newly in, newly formed company. And so that's an amalgamation of a whole range of IPs. So uh, for me, it's about ex exploring, trademarking that brand and protecting that brand and the message that that brand puts out, like Marie said, in terms of the tagline and what that offering is. So it's important for me to trademark that and because it'll be stamped on everything that we do in terms of the output of the licenses that we want to create or the affiliations or any of that, that IP that we put out there, it's important that we're going to protect that brand and what it's associated with. Yeah. No, look, this is it. You know, where you're in at this interesting stage is that you've developed a successful coaching practice and now you're developing it into something new. And when we met in December, I, I kind of, I think you were at the beginning of that process, if that's fair to say. Yeah. And, uh, and where you are three or four months later, you've decided that you're actually going to um, create a new expression of an idea, a new business operation, and, and, and therefore you've registered a new company and a new brand and a new identity to go with that. And all this is a really great, wonderful way of describing is the process of what happens when you actually develop your IP further. Um, and absolutely both have power. In fact, you may, you may keep your uh, coaching business and then just develop this as a separate business. And actually what we call that in IP terms is it's a spin-off. It's a spin-off company um, into something that actually you've identified can go to many more people. And that's the idea that when you leverage your intellectual property for greater growth, it can go from one to many. Other areas that might, uh, that we have, we only touched sort of briefly on, but could be explored further is educational products. I've got a real passion for education. I love running these sessions and I've given them away for free since 2015. But the point I'm making really is here is that a lot of my education clients are, have developed educational products. I have one particular client um, back down south in Melbourne and she runs entrepreneurial uh, skills for schools called Project Gen Z. And during COVID, she reinvented her own intellectual property by offering a number of her products online. So she doubled her, the amount of products she was offering. And only recently she, did she bring them all together and then we licensed those educational products out protecting the copyright, protecting the brand, and then therefore also different revenue streams, her traditional workshops in schools, but then also her online curriculum. So all of this is really valuable for anyone who is actually developing their, their intellectual property further. You've got to know what's in your hold. Otherwise, you can't sail to new trade routes. Finally, um, this area of licensing is actually worth touching on. And in this, on the second page here, this is the run of the most important pieces of advice I can give you as an intellectual property lawyer, is to understanding the power of licensing your intellectual property. This is how you go from one to many. This is how you go from a coach or consultant dealing with your time for money on one-on-one -on -one and selling your time in that respect. This is also how you go from a tourism operator into potentially a franchise of your tourism, uh, tourism business, which has been done many times before. Many of you would know AJ Hackett, you know, which is the bungee jump, um, uh, the bungee jump tourism attraction that came out of New Zealand, now offered in other parts of the world. A remarkable story of licensing a tourism enterprise uh, to many other areas. Um, <clears throat> and I think that it's worthy of noting here that this is where you leverage for greater growth. What we are uh, identified with in the Hinwood Institute, apologies for the small misspell there, um, but is that the licensing of Barbara's uh, materials and under her new pending trademark, it will generate her far more uh, traction with other clients. And therefore, she needs to consider her terms and conditions or and her licensing agreement in order to hit to, to offer that to other clients. I'll mention this in the context of other coaches and consulting. Um, one of the biggest uh, coaches in the world, you know, in terms of value, um, is a guy, an Australian by the name of Brad Sugars. Brad Sugars 
was a coach and a consultant once, but he has developed his coaching and consulting practice um, to offer it in every country in the world. And how he did that, apart from writing eight books and now basing himself on, you know, and doing a lot of uh, keynote speaking, is he sells a franchise called Action Coach. And whatever you're, uh, whether you've encountered an Action Coach before or not, the point is, is that he's leveraged his intellectual property on a worldwide scale, where he's actually sold his, um, sold his, uh, you know, practice out to entire territories. Whether if you want to become an action coach, you need to actually buy it off the Australian representative or the US representative. So at the end of the day, um, this is how you go from one to many. And Barbara, your plans for the next six months now that you're safe in this knowledge. Yeah, I've, I've realised in talking to you is that once again, is things like the GDPR statement, getting that right, um, the and, and having a schedule of how the material is to be used, not just what can be used, but how you can use it. You can use it for this or not for this. Uh, so there's, I've realised there's a lot. I It wasn't until talking to you that I realised, wow, I need to go back and do a bit of housekeeping and clean up some things. And I've realised too where there is, it's kind of like with hackers, you know, you leave yourself open for vulnerability. So if you don't have these things right, it could limit you. And certainly in terms of creating affiliations and joint ventures, people want to see evidence that this is this stuff is robust. Um, for example, the GDPR statement um, of, you know, what are you doing and how are you compliant? I've recently had somebody ask me about that and I was like, I don't even actually have that well consolidated or visible. Um, and on that, Gareth Murray asked a question before. She was saying, uh, um, do, you, do we need to have a statement on our website? Is that something that, do we actually need to have that declared somewhere on our website? A great question, and thank you, Marie, for asking it. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Under the Privacy Act 1988, every business requires a privacy policy. Often this is a public document displayed on your website, and it is needs to be carefully considered depending on the business that you're in. Um, the reason being... Sorry to interrupt you quickly. It's not, it's not the privacy policy that I'm talking about. I have that. I was asking if I need a GDPR statement on my website too. Okay. Thank you again for asking the Sorry, question. Sorry, just to clarify. Oh, I'm really happy to answer it. And the answer, uh, actually, um, earlier in the uh, presentation, um, have you got uh, clients in Europe? Yes. Okay, so the GDPR statement is an additional set of obligations that goes alongside the privacy policy. There's actually 10 obligations under the GDPR. Um, I won't go through them all now, but if you'd like to book a time complimentary to you, Marie, I'd really happy to talk about that in further detail. But basically, you have additional obligations with respect uh, to what uh, you need to comply with. Some of the examples are you need to be um, clear about what you're doing with client information and have strict protocols around how that information is secured and uh, other rights, such as the right of portability on request you know, freedom information to, to actually do things with the data, only what you, uh, you know, what, what is reasonable within the scope of your business. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. I'd, I'd really love to chat about that a bit further. Thank you. Yeah, no problems. And any business owner, it's a warm welcome for anyone that at the end of this call uh, would like to spend a, a little bit more time complimentary to you uh, to discuss any of these issues. Um, we might just get towards the end because I want to have some time for some questions. Um, and uh, Barbara, anything that you'd like to sum up on your journey uh, towards um, sailing, uh, sailing towards new waters with your new business and exciting new prospects behind that Hindwood Institute? Um, just reaffirming what I've said before, you know, I, I made, made me realise, like, I've got a privacy policy, like, like you just talked about, but GDPR, and I think for everybody on this call, I'd be surprised if there isn't someone on this call that's dealing with people 
beyond where they're physically sitting. Now in this digital world, we're creating so much opportunity. So, I, and I think that that makes us more vulnerable. Um, so there's a, this, I realise there's a lot more to learn around what I need to do to make my business robust. And I think too, what's really important, Gareth, what you've raised for me is that to be taken seriously as a business you know, not just a little, I, you, I've gone from being a sole trader into a company. So to be taken seriously as a business, showing that you've identified these risks and these compliances, that you've ticked all the boxes and you've done it well, demonstrates that your professionalism and your uh, sustainability and longevity and that you are a player in, in your industry, the fact that you've got this stuff in place. So there's a lot for me to do to clean up on, definitely. Okay, yeah, well, listen, and that was all a valuable of value, you know, in a, a um, sort of 45 minute hour session. So look, um, I'm happy to answer some questions just looking through the chat box here, because I want to just make sure that, you know, I haven't missed anything. And, and if anyone's got any further questions, uh, please pop them in the chat box now or feel free to unmute and, uh, and we'll answer them now. Um, Yeah, thank you for your help and good luck. Thank you, Cherie. That's very kind of you. Um, yeah, online, we see Gavin. Gavin's working in media, the online radio station podcast broadcast. Maybe a question for Gavin. How does he, how do you, sir, um, deal with intellectual property um, in any of the uh, your media you're creating? Um, a lot more deeply now after this um session but um yeah. with the understanding that i do know that anything that i create i have i do have ip over but yeah. in terms of i guess names and branding um and in the future training modules courses etc that would have to be looked into more in terms of ip and and protecting that yeah yeah, look, I, I think in the, uh, in the area of media, Gavin, yeah, you're, you're dealing with a lot of copyright and sometimes it's third party copyright, you know, sometimes it's content you create or perhaps you have an interview guest um, frequently on your show, on your podcast. Uh, again, as I alluded to earlier in the call, it's really important that you make sure that you get releases for any of the people that participate in your programs. Um, the reason being is that if you ever want to sell it on commercially, you need to get that clearance right from them. It's a big thing in media businesses or even digital businesses that are dealing with third-party copyright, um, but you can't sell it unless you have rights to it. So therefore, you need to have a clear chain of title on everything you're creating. Um, That's a really interesting one, Gareth. Sorry to interrupt there because, I, again, and I'm sure there's lots of other people that have been involved in, um, Marie, I'm sure you have as well, been involved in podcasts. And I don't know that I've ever signed a release of that nature um, to say you can't sell this interview that I'm doing with you. It's a really good, a really good point. Yeah, look, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it is really important, especially as your, your business grows. Um, can I just ask to maybe now skip towards the, the final slides, just as we're drawing a close here. I know everyone's time is uh, very valuable. Oh, by the way, there's the Hinwood Institute. Look out for that. And uh, Barbara's going to be a great representation of leveraging through licensing or intellectual property. Congratulations on all the growth you've achieved so far. Thank you, um, but Just now let's skip towards the end, if we can, because... Um, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, thank you kindly for your time today and sharing some of the, your stories. Um, the question I'd like to leave you is, is what will it take you for you to reach your gold? Uh, and is gold the only goal? There's a, a bit of a rhetorical question there. The thing that I like to share with people is that your identity has value and so has your ideas. Uh, and in this next slide, the last message I'd just like to leave with you with is, I hope, a positive one about the importance of valuing uh, of, the, of your own value in driving these ideas. If I can have the next and last slide, please. Um, and it is, is that you are the, the treasure. You are the one that drives the ideas and your ideas always have merit and worth. You are worthy of achieving the great success you deserve, but it begins with your valuation of your own identity and your own ideas first. This is how you grow valuable intellectual property, which can turn into not only a good business, but also 
um, helping others achieve success in, in the world with your ideas. This is my own personal belief, but I've also seen it work in many businesses before that have taken their own personal trials, their own uh, uh, personal journey, and then they have created a greater solution. As Gandhi once said, be the solution that you wish to be in the world. So Jen, just the last business note, um, in the last slides here, I have a special offer for everyone on the call. This is not a sales proposition. It is a, as a proposition to spend some more time with you. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, to spend some more time with you to develop an IP strategy from an IP assessment. Next slide, please. Um, then basically, uh, and the next slide uh, is just about a special offer for this free IP assessment. You've already got our, um, our, our, our sheet, our worksheet. Um, I'm willing to spend people who take the time to actually fill that out. Um, set up a time with me to have a discussion about the intellectual property in your business. This could be the GDPR. It could be your privacy statement. It could be a, a, assisting you to do a trademark search to actually see if you can actually gain registration of your brand. It could be a, about licensing, as I did recently with Barbara. And the other final note, I'd just like to say, I'm, I've just completed writing uh, my first book, and it is actually about the five steps to creating success in an ideas economy. Anyone that actually set, sets up a time by jumping on the Calendly link in the chat box, well, I will send to them also a complimentary chapter which covers these entire stories, case studies, and action overview of intellectual property in all its forms from copyright, trademarks, designs, patents, and contracts. And that's all in the book that I've recently finished. I've just worked with my editor this morning. I've been up since the early morning finishing off um, uh, that edit in order to give you um, a gift, which is uh, a chapter on uh, intellectual property and how to build um, and leverage your own growth. Um, and this is just a quick preview of the, uh, of the book, but um, on the next slide, please. But thank you very much for your time. Happy to hang around for other questions. Um, we and the thank you slide at the end. Thank you so much also, Barbara, for helping putting this together. I'm from IP Assist. And, um, and thank you, Barbara, for all your support um, towards putting this event on. Thanks, Garrett. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Um, do you have a bit of time now for this, some couple of questions in the, in the chat? Are you free to, to, to answer some yep. of those questions? All right, I'll read Happy them. To. Awesome, I'll read them for you. Sarah's asked, uh, what are your options if someone copies your IP and resells or modifies for resale? Maybe we can just take the slides off for this, these last moments. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, just so it's a bit more of a personal end for everyone. Thank you very much. And thanks for helping us get through those slides today, Barbara. Yeah, basically, um, uh, just please repeat the question. Uh, now I've got to find it because I just took the slides off. Hang on, <laughs> I'm coming to it. What, what are your options if someone copies your IP and resells or modifies for resale? Okay, really good question. Okay, prevention is in the eyes of the IP holder. So it is up to you to enforce the intellectual property that you create. Um, and therefore, um, if it's something like your trademark, when you've got a registered trademark, legally you're actually empowered to, uh, to bring, uh, bring people up on it and serve a cease and desist letter. Um, it's actually a very strong legal enforceable right. That's one reason that you should, one, always use your trademark on your products, services, education materials everywhere, because then you're able to use the Trademarks Act to actually serve what's called a cease and desist notice and put people on notice. Often people do respond very well to them. It's a strict slap on the wrist. And if you've gone to the effort of registering your trademark, then why wouldn't you? Copyright is a little bit harder to enforce however it's still possible i recommend therefore you work conjunction with trademark or other registered uh, intellectual property uh, in order to prevent other people from using it another question that we've got here is um Oh, where are we? Category Amur has said, category 9, 41 and 42 apply to me. Do you want to cover on what categories mean? Yeah, absolutely. When you register a trademark, then um, lodgement goes into the uh, trademark's office and you're actually at that stage um, with appropriate advice, registering in the categories that you anticipate to be in business in the next 10 years. 
Okay, so there's 45 different classes, products, uh, goods and products, products first, then goods. Um, Register 9, for example, is a good. That's a software uh, category. If you're in a digital uh, business, then that's going to be very important to you. But if you're a consultant like Barbara is or in education, then class 35 or class 41 as a service is going to be much more important. At the end of the day, it will serve you to get uh, the uh, advice from an IP specialist as to the proper class to register in because it's a little bit like putting an engine in your car. You don't want to get it wrong. Um, and you want to make sure that you get the right classes so that therefore you are protected for the next 10 years of your business. And I realised too that when I, I'm not covered now because at the time that I did my trademarking, I said, no, I'm never going to write a book, but now I am. So, you know, and I'm not covered in that class that I've got. Um, Amir has asked another question. I'm not sure if he's still on the Zoom call, but he did say, do you feel India is worthless in applying for a trademark or registered trademark in? I know he's got a lot of business in India at the moment. Um, the answer to that question is, is to um, register in your own backyard first. Uh, you can't take your, your business and your logo to India unless it's registered in your home country. I mean, you could register in India, but if you're, I'm assuming that the business is a Australian business. Um, so therefore, you need to first register in Australia. And the other advantage of a trademark is that once you're actually registered with IP Australia, because Australia is signed up to what's called the Madrid Protocol, you actually gain access to actually uh, their system of registering internationally. It's a separate step to after you re register your Australia trademark. But then you can actually take your, take your trademark to 115 different countries, including, I understand, India. India, I understand, is part of the Madrid Protocol. So therefore, you know, the answer, quick, quick question, uh, quick answer is register in your own backyard first, register in Australia gain access to the Madrid protocol and then take it to other countries at the time that you're exploring business in those countries. So start with Australia. And the one last point I'll make on that is that if you register um, in Australia and then register in India, for example, through the Madrid in the first six months, you'll gain the same priority date. So there's an advantage there um, to actually registering first in Australia and then in India quickly because you'll actually get an earlier priority date. You can do it later on down the track, but it won't be at the same date that you register your Australian trademark. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, Gareth, I've got a question for you on that, um, just in terms of trademarking and protecting yourself in other countries, because you've talked about who's got clients in Europe and now the world's our oyster in terms of digital. I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, China does not comply with trademarking and copywriting. It has its own registration. So if you want to operate business within China, you have to have a separate trademarking, um, otherwise you're not covered in China. Is, is right. that correct or is that a myth? Yeah, it is correct. Yeah, yeah, it is correct. You know, we're in a common law country, so therefore we have our common law system that we, um, we acquired from the British uh, as does America, Canada, uh, um, and, and other countries in the world. However, China is a different country with an intellectual property system. However, their cultural approach to intellectual property is vastly different. You can register a trademark in China, but you've got to register it in their system. And other seminars that have run on this, particularly when dealing with Asia, is that you've got to really ascertain whether it's worth it, given, you know, given their uh, cultural, let's just say, cultural approach to intellectual property. So um, there is uh, resources on IP Australia's website, even with dealing with China. It is something you need to be discreet and diligent with. Um, and, and you need a separate strategy when dealing with uh, China um, is the best answer to that question for now. Thank you. That's great. Like, Sorry, can like I just... Boat, um... right, you know, like with China, you're going to have a different trade route and a different approach to how you do, approach, say, America, UK, and potentially even Europe because we have similar uh, systems and therefore with China, you need to draw a different map, so to speak. Go ahead, Marie. Sorry, I just wanted to jump in there quickly before we change topic, because it's exactly on a topic that I wanted to go a little bit further on that. Um, with my Loving Life After Loss, I have trademarked that in Australia. So as you said, you know, starting your own backyard and then had a person approach me that she wanted to run that in South America. Um, and probably actually just one country in particular, but I don't want to go too specific here because it's still in, you know, out in the open. And um, 
I don't even know, because you just mentioned something. I didn't really understand what you said. That's why I wanted to jump in. Mention something about when you um, reach the Union backyard first, and then, you know, you go to India, or in my case, South America, uh, that you've got early priority or something. What was that? I, I didn't really understand what you meant by that. Um, so an example, uh, Marie, is that when did you register in Australia? Um, what day? I'd say a year ago, if not earlier. I can't remember yeah. the exact date. I have to check it up. The reason I ask is that if you did it six months ago, I would say that mm -hmm. you, then, therefore, if you're going to an international country, you'd be able to make an application and have it have the same priority date, what's called a priority date. When you lodge with the trademark office, that sets what's called a priority date. So anyone after that date cannot, unless they, they get their own trademark application in and approved, um, yeah. it, through the process, it's backdated to that date. So therefore, if you're registering overseas and you intend to register both in Australia and overseas, do it at the yeah. same time. If your business is still okay. growing, then wait the time, but just know you won't get the same day. Okay, so I, I'm not really sure how to approach this because uh, she talked to me about it and uh, the loss of her husband was relatively recently. So she said she had a lot of things to sort out, but she's really interested in taking that on, getting coached by me to, you know, build the whole thing. And I'd be the perfect person to teach her that because I've done the whole setup. I've got everything ready. Um, I'd be very interested in giving her the whole package, you know, and uh, actually uh, send her a quote of, you know, the, the name, the products that I have that she can translate and use them all in her country. Um, yet here's the thing. And um, she's an international lawyer. And my worry is that if I leave it too long, that she could go in the background and go like, ah, she's not registered here and does it all on her own, doesn't have to pay me and runs her own thing under my name because I'm not registered there. Do you know what I mean? But just going and registering it and then she does it under a completely different name with the complete same thing, nothing's stopping her from doing that. So is it wasted money if I go and register it or should I do it to be safe? Do you know what I mean? It's it's a, have you it's got? A catch uh, I'll ask a couple of questions, if you don't mind, just on that. Do you have customers in that country currently? Uh, no, it's not my main clientele there. So no direct clients at the moment. I've definitely got people from there in do my you, movement, in my group, but not directly clients at the moment. Do you have client? Do you anticipate having clients there in the next five years? The reason I ask these questions, Marie, is, is only to ascertain whether it's worth it. Um, and, and I'd yeah. like to follow this discussion with actually uh, abundance versus scarcity. If you mm -hmm. approach your intellectual property from a point of scarcity, you'll come mm -hmm. like, I've got things to steal. If you come mm -hmm. from a mentality like I do with yeah. my presentations, it's about sharing so yeah. Because therefore you never get, you'll go further if you share. Now, yeah, what, I agree. The comment that you made, I, I think, is coming from scarcity, if, if you don't mind me saying, because no, I feel no. like, you know, I feel I feel that actually um, that, that the fundamentals of intellectual property help us out here, that IP mm. protects your expression of ideas, not your ideas yourself. You you'll, will never be the only business that deals in coaching. Yeah. You know, there's many on the call. Your mm. expression what's unique and it's very hard to replicate someone's expression i, I just would yeah. like to make a point and that's why i actually suggest that not to be cons overly concerned about it mm -hmm. people will try and you know discredit you people will try and take the things that you've created and then many entrepreneurs see that as a compliment it's a better way yeah. to actually do it yeah no because, I, I agree um, i'm glad you made that comment because it's just yeah yeah no, no, no. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. I, I have an absolute abundance mindset around that. In that particular case, it was something I had to understand. That's why I asked that question. Not not actually coming from scarcity, yeah, yeah. because I agree with you. There, there's so much out there. And at the end of the day, I just want to heal the world. And I know that sounds... Yeah, um, it's really you know, important. And, and the more the merrier. And I think if I get... And, and that's the exact answer I needed to hear, because I think if I get hung up with in what country or what other countries I need to register that, I, 
my focus would be in a complete wrong direction. Yeah. I don't want to do that. You know, I'd rather want to focus on Marie, building what I have. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, Marie, the, the, the answer there too is to just to have a strategy um, and that strategy mm. can um, with time. It's on your, on your strategy. It's on your map, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but um, I think it, you, you should never make any decisions out of scarcity or, and fear of oh, no, this person. I agree. Instead, focus on your core, your core purpose, the core reason for the business, and it yeah. will grow organic. And at the right time, you'll go into the country uh, and register yeah. it when it's the right time. Yeah. yeah. And I'll just make Thank an, for everyone's benefit, and you're, you're very welcome, is that, that, you know, you don't go and register all your, it's most important if there's one thing to take away from today is to, to just have a consideration of a strategy around your IP. Um, the reason being is that um, you can't do everything at once and you shouldn't. I mean, even in terms of trademark, um, you know, if you were the, just in startup or in the first 12 months, I'd probably say consider it a two to three years. Why? Because that's the time that you have a client base that other copycats could come up and could prevent you or take, you know, pass off your business. Everyone this call, I'm assuming, has been in business more than 12 or 24 months and therefore it serves you to actually protect you, yourself at these stages. When you go on to other countries, it's when you've got clients, the same room. Usually that's about three to five to six years, you'll have international clients. That's the time to consider international trademark. Mm. Unless you're flying with business now, which I'd be very happy for you, and then therefore you should say, I've got to protect all my clients or my brand in the UK. I had a client who moved to the mm. UK. She's drifted. She started her business three, four years ago, now based in the UK. She's got both trademarks. Mm. Australia, okay, for example. Yeah. Any other questions before we end? I will just remind you that there is that link in the chat box. I am very happy to give you another hour of my time, one-on-one, -on -one, to discuss in your business. It's something that I would do uh, frequently. It's something that I do and I enjoy doing. Uh, I'm in the territory to go and help businesses on their pathway of growth. Really happy to share some more offline. Um, and you, all you do is you click through that calendar link and set up a time in the next 10 days. Um, is there any other final questions, reflections, anything else anyone would like to share? I just oh, wanted I just to say- quick yeah, one. I, Sorry, you go, Paul. I've, I've signed up for some time with you. I've enjoyed this greatly. IP has always been an interest. I, I taught a semi-business law thing, but international thing. And as we get through like Happy Neighborhood Project, I'm finding more friends in Australia than I, or the UK than I am in the United States. So it's like, I may be selling some courses or something there. So I may need to need to do something. So I will be picking your brain. And uh, I just, as I tell people in Australia, I just need you to open up so I can land and, and then live on the beach somewhere and, and enjoy and, say, oh, and have a place to stay. This has reached you. Which part of the States are you in? I'm in Arizona. Arizona, fantastic. Oh, that's very the territory in terms of climate. You know, we're a desert, desert, uh, an arid, but, but there's a lot of innovation that comes out of the desert. It'd be a pleasure to spend time with you, sir. Oh, yeah. Intel and Motorola and all those, all of those little companies started here and, and so forth. So, hey, it's only 110, 118. It's a dry heat, we say. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, awesome. Great to have the Global Village on the call. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Anyone else? Uh, or I'll, we... I'll just book a call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, look, that's probably the best use of time from now. Um, you know, Barbara's been through that process. I'm looking forward to going on the journey further with her. I think it's just been a, a really nice to share with you today. It's one of the joys of actually being an IP lawyer to be on. <laughs> And Gary, you, you make a really interesting, it's a pretty dry subject, but I love chatting to you because it, you make it really interesting and you learn, you learn so much more. So thank you, really thank you for sharing your time with us today. And I know anyone that's watching, there's a, quite a few lot of people that are going to be watching the recording as well. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for being so generous with your time today. It's a pleasure. Um, it's actually how I believe you amplify your own intellectual property. It's sharing it but being doing it in a commercially sensible way. Awesome.
All righty. Well, we might we might leave it there. I'll be sure to email out your Calendly link to everyone, Gareth, so they if they haven't already, oh, they can book appointment. That'd be great. Yeah, and look forward to meeting you all online. Yeah, and now we're in lockdown. That doesn't mean we're in shutdown. Uh, we've got to all keep uh, building our ideas. Yeah, final fact is that some of the biggest businesses that are now commonplace uh, in the uh, you know in our worlds began in the GFC in two thousand and eight. And that's Airbnb, Uber, and Spotify. So this is a great time to grow. If you're in the territory, if you're in Darwin and you're in lockdown, this is a great time to, to get behind your ideas and, uh, and keep pushing on uh, with an abundant mindset. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Thanks. Look forward to connecting with you soon. Bye. Thanks, bye.